Yep, yeah, okay. Right. I was asked to talk about transnational working in the World Heritage Convention. Um, and what I want to do is I want to start by looking at what I think was intended when the convention was first adopted, and then to look at what has actually happened since then and what is happening now, all very briefly. Right. The convention, as Becky has said, is based on the belief that international cooperation is a key part of protecting cultural and natural heritage. And it needs to be seen, although it hasn't always been, as part of a general UNESCO approach to conservation, which includes a number of other conventions. And increasingly, UNESCO is trying to bring the World Heritage Convention in more directly into the overall work of UNESCO, which in the past wasn't always the case. There is a system of sorts starting point is that the World Heritage Convention, if a state party signs up to it, is a treaty with legal obligations for, for the signatories. If your country joins the World Heritage Convention, there are things you have to do. But it's up to you as to how you do them. And it's up to each state party can implement the convention as it thinks best. The convention sets general standards the objectives and so on, in a fairly short document for UNESCO. And then there are the operational guidelines, which are now over 100 pages and rising almost annually, as they think of something else they need to talk about. And the convention appointed advisory bodies to give professional advice. And these are ICROM. You all know what ICROM? International Centre for Conservation in Rome. Actually, nobody's actually quite sure what the initials do stand for, because they change it from time to time. But basically, it's there to do training in cultural heritage and a certain amount of research. ICOMOS, International Council on Monuments and Sites, uh, which advises on cultural heritage, not surprisingly, and IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which advises <laughs> on natural sites. Okay. And... They are there to give professional advice, and UNESCO has a secretariat which is there to do all the things the secretariats are meant to do. But because they created a separate World Heritage Centre back in 1992, the secretariat has also acquired professional expertise as it's gone through time, um, with the result that you can get tensions between what the secretariat wants to do and what the advisory bodies advise them to do. Um, and the convention also established reporting systems on its implementation. So states parties have to say how they're doing and what they're doing. At the property level, the World Heritage Site, there are certain inescapable relationships you're going to have with UNESCO. Although it has to be said, there are sites out there which once they were inscribed, haven't come up on the radar at all in the last 20 or 30 years either because they're managed perfectly or because nobody has noticed that they're not. But clearly, you're going to be involved with UNESCO and the relevant advisory body, natural or cultural, when your property is nominated, evaluated, and then inscribed. And these days, when they inscribe it, they may well make recommendations to how you should manage it. You have to meet the national requirements for the management of World Heritage Properties, which should be your government's interpretation of how the convention should be implemented. Um, you should be using the operational guidelines and other guidance, and you should check to make sure you're using the most recent edition, because it's changing at least every two years at the moment. And the one reporting exercise you can't miss now is what's called periodic reporting, which happens on a six to eight year cycle when the state party, the government, reports on its overall fulfilment of the Convention's requirements, and the sites, the site managers, moderated by the national focal point, um, if necessary, report on how their individual sites are doing. And that's something that all World Heritage Properties have to do. The other reporting system is state of conservation or reactive monitoring, which happens if your property has problems which if you're an urban site in the UK, means you're on the list probably. Liverpool, Westminster, Tower of London, Edinburgh, um, all are in the reactive monitoring cycle because people are still trying to work out 
how much urban development and redevelopment and what, it, what is appropriate in the context of a World Heritage Site. So these are points at which the site will meet UNESCO either directly or indirectly through your national focal point. But the Convention was also looking at the wider opportunities for cooperation and underpinning it, this comes from the preamble of the Convention, um, was the belief that the whole of the international community needs to combine to participate to protect heritage. And in the Convention itself, the preamble is just talk, which sets out general ideas, but the articles of the Convention itself deliberately stipulate that they're that there should be an international system of cooperation. States parties should work with each other. States parties shouldn't undertake any deliberate measures which destroy other people's heritage. You would think this was obvious, but they felt it necessary to say so. Um, and establishing a system of international cooperation and a system designed to support other states parties and each other. And I think at the time, what they were thinking of yes let's cover up with that I think what they had in mind was what they were used to which were the big UNESCO safeguarding campaigns of the 50s and 60s what is I've heard people call the heroic age things like the movement of the Abu Simbel temples to avoid them being flooded by the Aswan High Dam things like the Venice campaign um, Venice is sinking in the 60s which was there to try and conserve Venice from collapse. Interestingly, the problem of Venice collapsing is still there. But, in fact, since 1972, there's only been one campaign on this scale, which has been Angkor Wat. And that, in many ways, wasn't coordinated. If you had an Indian project, an American project, and various other people's projects, what you end up with is temples conserved according to the system of each country, and not necessarily what the Cambodians needed. Um, which is one of the problems of international involvement in your property if you're not in a strong enough position to tell them you don't like what they want to do. And the other continuing theme that goes right through is that universities and things like the British Schools of Archaeology, which are already working in what became World Heritage Properties, have gone on doing so. So if, for example, you go to Pompeii, it's littered, I use the word advisedly, with the results of past interventions by Italian and, uh, and foreign universities who have done excavations, not necessarily backfilled them properly, have carried out experimental conservation and building covering, all of which had very little control from the Italian government, as far as I can see, until very recently. And that sort of tradition has continued and does continue but doesn't always work sufficiently with the needs of the World Heritage Site and the World Heritage Convention. Um, and that's something that needs to be watched. Also, the other thing that the Convention sets up is a World Heritage Fund, which is a compulsory contribution by states' parties of a maximum of 1% of the budget they pay to UNESCO, which is based on a formula established by the United Nations, which means the Americans pay most, except, of course, because America has stopped paying a subscription to UNESCO. They've lost 20% of their budget, and the World Heritage Fund has lost 20% of its budget. Um, it was created to enable international assistance, and for the reasons I stated, it's declining in value. Obviously, the help goes to the countries which most need it, which doesn't include us, and it's used primarily for emergency assistance after a disaster, conservation and management assistance, and preparatory assistance, which basically is about preparing tentative lists and nominations. Um, where it gets spent varies, but it is mostly least developed countries and so on. Um, and some projects have gone on for a long time. Some produce more results than others. There are other forms of international work involving the Convention, 
which weren't necessarily foreseen when the Convention was adopted. You have the work of the advisory bodies, ICROM, ICOMOS, IUCN, and you all know what they are now. Um, they produce thematic and other guidance. ICOMOS, for example, produces thematic studies on classes of monument. IUCN produces guidance on various things. Um, ICROM publishes reports. Lots to see if you look on their websites. They do training, principally ICROM for cultural her heritage and IUCN for natural heritage. ICOMOS and IUCN evaluate nominations and recommend to the committee what they should do in the way of inscription or not inscription, and they are heavily involved in state of conservation reporting. If you have a serious state of conservation case, you get an ICOMOS UNESCO mission. Henry will tell you all about those, because he's doing, as far as I can tell, three or four a year at the moment. Um, another thing which has developed, which I don't think was foreseen at the outset, is expert meetings to develop policy, made up of international experts, however defined, who are brought together to look at a particular issue. One of the most successful was the one which established the concept of cultural landscapes back in 1992. There have been various others since then. Mostly, they happen because there's a problem. And then some state party, which is particularly affected by the problem, offers money for a meeting in the hope of getting a solution out of the meeting, which it will largely run, to resolve the issues and come up with something which suits them. And normally you get something that's a bit of a mix. Um, again, some of these produce good results. Some of them produce results which just vanish away like the mist in the morning. Another area which is strong is bilateral funds in trusts agreements between states and UNESCO. This is where governments, as it might be the French, the Germans, the Italians, the Spanish, but not the British currently, make a bilateral agreement with UNESCO to provide money to carry out particular tasks. This is different to putting money into the World Heritage Fund because the state party who's giving the money because it's a bilateral agreement, retains considerable control over where it's spent and who does the work, which is quite important in terms of the conservation professions in their own countries. There is then the World Heritage Centre PACT programme, and I have to say I can't remember exactly what PACT stands for. I was in the process of Googling it when I was called to the desk. <laughs> but it's it's basically about setting up partnerships basically with private industry, NGOs and so on. Um, the most successful of those was the World Heritage Fund created uh, by an American broadcast turner uh, which spent a vast amounts of, amount of money on natural heritage and the World Heritage Centre sets up these partnerships with a variety of people. For example, their programme of sustainable tourism is being largely funded by a cruise company um, which called Seaborn, which is providing the money which funds work on sustainable tourism programmes. And then you have the multilateral funders who can operate totally outside the UNESCO framework. And that includes people like the World Bank, regional development banks and the European Union who do quite a lot of work on potential World Heritage Sites in places like Africa. Right. You then have other assistance which bypasses UNESCO. You have direct government aid to developing states or to individual properties. The UK government has just started to do this through the Cultural Protection Fund, which was spoken about yesterday, and quite a lot of the applications for that do affect or are about World Heritage Sites or partly about World Heritage Sites. The Portuguese have a programme of supporting heritage in all their former colonies, which is something the UK has not copied, possibly because we have rather more. Um, and they give grant aid, they give money for that. Um, university research projects I've managed, I've mentioned, there are site twinning arrangements between sites in some parts in Europe, for example, and sites which need assistance elsewhere. And quite a large proportion of World Heritage properties in Europe 
claim to have twinning agreements according to the last round of periodic reporting, although we didn't ask what those agreements actually involved, apart from jollies. And then in, you find governments, both in Europe and elsewhere, or site management authorities, buying in external advice on occasion, on at least one occasion that I'm aware of, basically for the, nat the national government has persuaded the regional authorities to buy in external consultants to tell the regional authorities what the national government wants to, but the regional authorities won't listen to. At least that's my take on it. So there is quite a lot of activity out there, and some of it is not very structured. Um, the area which I haven't talked about, because it comes up in the next topic, is transnational monuments, which are a good idea, but are turning out to be quite complicated in application. We started with something simple called the Struve Arc, which is a series of triangulation points going from the North Cape to the Black Sea, constructed in the days when you only went through three states parties on the way. Now it goes through about 12. Um, and that was easy. Then you come on to rather more complicated ones, like European spas and so on. Um, but basically, there's a lot of international activity out there. You can try and codify it, but it's developing and changing all the time as people want to do different things. And a lot of it is now happening, as far as I can see, outside the direct control of UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee. Although, of course, the state's parties giving the aid will be very often members of the committee anyway. Thank you.